solar system is but a speck in the huge galaxy we call the Milky Way. This vast wheel in space may contain a million stars comparable to our sun. A million other planetary systems capable of sustaining forms of life similar to those we know. In the past 30 years, we have learned a lot about our solar system, our galaxy, and the cosmos at large. Satellites and space laboratories have borne scientists and electronic instruments above the turbulent layers of the Earth's atmosphere. For 25 years, the radio telescope has been probing space over enormous distances. discovered radiation belts, pulsars, quasars, and black holes. Scientists are now convinced that we are not alone in the universe. phenomenon provides crucial evidence to support this claim. Alien civilizations may have been monitoring us for over 3,000 years. This Egyptian papyrus describes a luminous display which startled the armies of Thutmosis III. The Greeks and Romans too observed UFOs and the curiosity they aroused during the Renaissance is evident from engravings and newspaper accounts of the time. The miniaturist Hans Glaser illustrated the Nuremberg sighting of 1561. Five years later, the Basel Gazette reported that at the hour of sunrise, Many big black balls were seen in the air, traveling at great speeds toward the sun, then crashing into one another as if they were fighting. A great number of them became red and inflamed before being extinguished. Closer to the 20th century, we find more specific accounts of weird airships, but not until 1947 was the popular term of flying saucer coined when Kenneth Arnold asserted that the fantastic phenomena he had witnessed must be manufactured objects from outer space. Photographs of UFOs flood in from all over the world. Many are hoaxes, like this picture of a hubcap. But the public is on the verge of panic. The U.S. Air Force instigates a commission of inquiry, Project Blue Book. A bulky report is published. Its conclusion? The UFO phenomenon is not worthy of scientific investigation.
According to the Air Force, all UFOs can be accounted for in terms of man-made objects or natural occurrences. A lenticular cloud can look like a flying saucer. So can northern lights, created by the electrical particles which constitute solar winds, not to mention lightning balls and the like. Our sky is crisscrossed continually with aircraft, weather balloons, space research devices, barium clouds. But what should we believe when there seems to be no available logical explanation for the claims of reliable witnesses? This is the question Dr. J. Allen Hynek began to ask himself. Dr. Hynek is an astronomer. While acting in his official capacity as scientific advisor to the U.S. Air Force, he found himself obliged to revise his attitude to UFOs drastically. This device is certainly food for the imagination. But man-made objects move in a predictable fashion. Balloons, for instance, follow the prevailing wind. When in doubt, an investigator can check with the meteorological office for the dates and times of balloon launchings and for details of wind directions. More recently, space rockets have begun to make spectacular re-entries into the atmosphere. Obviously, it is not hard to be fooled. Yet, there remain a good 100,000 reports of UFO sightings which continue to baffle scientists. Dr. Hynek, the Dean of American Ufologists, established a system of classifying UFO reports which has since been generally adopted. Firstly, we have UFOs observed from far away. These may be further divided into lights seen at night. Objects which have been detected by radar as well as being observed by one or more witnesses. And discs seen during the day. The second group comprises encounters with closer objects, close encounters of the first kind, less than 150 yards away, close encounters of the second kind, physical traces are left. Close encounters of the third kind, occupants have been observed. Let's look first at sightings made from a distance. Here is a good example of a daylight disc photographed by Mr. and Mrs. Trent in 1950. Dr. Hynek's method of analysis gives predominance to sightings corroborated by more than one witness. The documents which you will see now were almost all confirmed by several observers, sometimes completely independent of one another. A strikingly similar UFO was snapped in 1954 by a French pilot. This film is a classic of its kind. Let's take another look at those luminous balls in slow motion. This document has been examined by various experts. Their carefully weighed conclusion is that the shining spheres could not possibly be aircraft reflecting the sun, nor any other known objects. A remarkable number of reports come from highly responsible people. In this case, 
Several air traffic controllers observed a nocturnal light through binoculars. It proceeded to split in two and then to perform aerial acrobatics, apparently oblivious to the strong wind which was blowing. Other UFO witnesses include radar technicians, pilots, police and army officers, astronauts and scientists, even astronomers. These nocturnal lights in boomerang formation were observed sweeping over a small town by several separate groups of people. Here's another film from the wave of flying saucer sightings which continued through the 1950s. It was shot by a Navy photographer. No logical explanation for the white discs has ever been found. The vertical bar was printed onto the film by the Air Force to facilitate analysis of the object's flight angles. The Air Force added these views of seagulls as an explanation Yet the sunlight flickers violently on the wings of the birds, and the flight patterns have little in common. The comparison does not help us to identify the phenomenon. Above all, the main witness is adamant that the spheres he observed bore no resemblance to anything he had previously seen during his career as an aerial photographer. This frame is all that remains of a film shot by Corporal Ralph Mayer and confiscated by the Air Force. The UFO in this publicity photograph of a Martin B-57 prototype was only picked up on processing. We can use the same photo to illustrate the famous 1952 case of the American base at Davis Montham. Two bright disks intercepted a B-36 and stayed in formation with it for 20 seconds. The terror-stricken crew requested permission to land immediately. Nine members of base personnel also witnessed the UFOs from the ground. The official report on this case disappeared mysteriously. Government representatives have often gone as far as suppressing UFO evidence, but the exact scale of the cover-up operation is hard to judge. This Brazilian Navy vessel was on an oceanographic research mission. Forty-eight witnesses observed the UFO from the deck. It had a metallic appearance with a halo of greenish phosphorescent vapor. The Brazilian government guaranteed the authenticity of the photographs and stood behind the witnesses. Thirty people observed this disk in New Mexico. The object was also picked up on radar. The number of witnesses is of paramount importance when considering the authenticity of a UFO photograph. When the photographer was on his own, as in this case, we have only his word. According to Rex Heflin, the dome left behind a ring of smoke, which he was able to photograph. Two good color photographs now. In each case, there were six witnesses. UFOs do not always look like spaceships. The variety of shapes, colors, and textures is extraordinary. The pulsating lights illustrated in this animation sequence suggest the presence of a strong magnetic field. 
Many researchers consider that the propulsion system of UFOs may be linked to their ability to create an electromagnetic field. It is 1965. Ed White is the first American to walk in space. During the space program, many photographs of UFOs were taken. Unfortunately, however, these NASA documents are not accompanied by circumstantial reports. Astronauts Jim McDivitt, Frank Borman, and Neil Armstrong openly claimed that they had seen UFOs in space, as well as several others, including Russian cosmonauts. In many cases, NASA could not come up with any explanation. Also in 1965, a Canadian film board crew happened to be on the spot when this mysterious object appeared in the sky. It is the clouds and the camera which are moving. The object remained stationary and was seen by dozens of people over a period of several hours. Its size was fantastic. Nobody has been able to identify it. Abruptly it disappeared as if it had swung into another dimension. We are still in the Canadian West. One evening in July, three men were returning home from a weekend devoted to mineral prospecting. Suddenly, an object appeared in the sky. Warren Smith took two photos. The first one shows the classical flying saucer shape of two pie plates, one on top of the other. Then the object went out of sight behind trees to reappear rising vertically towards the south. Smith quickly made a second exposure. The UFO phenomenon is multifarious. There is perhaps a natural explanation for this luminous mass, but where do all the metallic looking objects come from? Like a virus attacking an organism, they are challenging our concepts and disturbing our environment. One, zero, all engines running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Roger, we got a roll from. Tower clear. Roger, roll. All complete and efficient program. In 1969, the American government put an end to its Project Blue Book. In this year, too, man made an old dream a reality. On July 20th, in the course of the longest night, three lone men cut the umbilical cord linking us to Mother Earth for the first time. But walking on the moon was only a beginning. Probes have since visited other planets, and one day we will explore other stars. Maybe other intelligent beings have already responded to the same urge. We know that some planetary systems are millions of years older than ours. Perhaps the galaxy has already been colonized by means of a technology infinitely more advanced than our own. 
interstellar traffic may be heavier than today's air traffic over the United States. The crew of the Apollo 11 mission would also see things. After their first day in space, Armstrong and Aldrin observed a strange object traveling slowly between their rocket and the moon. It was huge and L-shaped, but no photograph of it has been published. Let's imagine that when we landed on the moon, the local population had been lined up to welcome us. What would we have done? We would probably have said, take me to your leader, and attempted to make some official contact, if at all possible. Here we have one of the profoundly disturbing aspects of the UFO phenomenon. Their occupants, in general, make no effort to enter into contact. On the contrary, they seem rather to avoid it systematically. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the limb now. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. During the Apollo program, these strange luminous balls were photographed close to the moon and close to Earth, this impressive, big, misshapen object. The astronauts of the Skylab project also saw UFOs. The Skylab 2 crew observed an extremely bright round object rotating on itself. Here, a shape which is suggestive of a vehicle with lights. In the 70s now, in Montreal, Michel Ambeau saw this squadron of lights over the St. Lawrence. This object projected truncated shafts of light, frequently observed elsewhere as well. The shafts of light have the amazing capacity to lengthen and retract at a rate visible to the human eye. In Switzerland, a professional photographer and two friends watched this object suspended in the air. This bizarre trajectory was photographed near Kansas City in 1975. On the very same evening, at the same time, 1045 on November 10th, a geophysicist noticed an unusual geomagnetic disturbance recorded by his instruments. Let's take a look now at two exceptional documents. First, a film shot in California from a helicopter by a professional cameraman filming coastal scenes. It lasts only 12 seconds. In slow motion, What can this silvery metallic object be 
its superstructure bathed in sunlight, moving at a speed of 160 miles per hour. It is not a balloon, and quite obviously not a cloud. The television crew was shooting a car commercial in Guatemala when a fantastic object erupted into the sky over the city. It was observed by many witnesses. The cameraman's reflexes were good. Without stopping to think, he panned his video camera skyward. In this remarkable document, a fantastic happening explodes the routine of daily life with spectacular unexpectedness. Stunned, unable to believe their eyes, passers-by in the busy streets of Guatemala's capital city crane their necks for a last glimpse of the UFO. Here it is again in slow motion. The original videotape was transferred to 16 millimeter film, which accounts for the flickering lines in the picture. This film is real. The object we see is real, like thousands of others. But one question remains unanswered. What are they? Are UFOs reconnaissance missions from intelligent civilizations of extraterrestrial origin? Or are they the product of some higher plane of reality, hitherto unsuspected by science? Are they some kind of psychic feedback of our own unconscious? Or something else completely different? something we have not even dreamed of. Close encounters of the second kind occur when the UFO leaves some physical evidence on the environment. During the night, two young girls saw a luminous mass gliding away from their farmhouse. The next day, the farmer discovered a circle of devastation 40 feet across in his soybean field. It had not been there the previous evening. Dr. Hynek personally investigated this case. He remarked that the leaves were hanging from each plant. They were withered, as if they had been exposed to intense heat. The stalks were not broken, however, and the ground was unmarked, indicating that the heat had come from above.
with no direct contact between the object and the plants. Here we have tangible physical evidence, concrete confirmation of a sighting, which we have missed sorely until now. Sometimes the soil may appear to have been compressed beneath a weight of several tons, or baked by incredibly intense heat. Ted Phillips has collected over a thousand examples involving the physical effects left by UFOs. They include severe burns inflicted on human beings. This daylight film Polaroid photograph shows the glowing ring left by a multicolored object. After the fascinated witnesses had touched the circle, they experienced a numbness in their fingers which lasted for several days. The following day, the local sheriff was on the spot and a second photograph was taken. The soil of the ring is dried out in spite of the recent rain, while both within and outside the ring it remains very soggy. A broken branch hangs from a tree. It is brittle, as if it had been dead for a long time. But beneath the bark, the wood is green. One month later, the snow is thawing, making the area a marshland. The ring is still dry, as delineated by the unmelted snow. Seeds refuse to grow in it, while the earth around it produces healthy grass. The electron microscope reveals icicle-shaped crystals, hitherto unknown. After five metallic dome shapes had been seen rising vertically from a field, five rings were photographed by Canadian police. Notice the clockwise rotation. UFOs have also been reported as having stalled cars and caused electrical power failures. November 2nd, 1957 was a night to remember for police officer Fowler. At 11 p.m., he answered a telephone call from Pedro Sosido, four miles out of Level Land, Texas, where he was driving a truck with Joe Salaz. They had been on Highway 116 when they saw a big flame ahead of them, a little to the right. As it approached, the engine stalled and the truck's headlights were extinguished. Saucedo further reported that when he got out to take a look, it was so hot that he threw himself on the ground. He described the UFO as a torpedo with a speed of 1,500 or 2,000 miles per hour. Officer Fowler concluded that his caller was in a state of inebriation. An hour later, the telephone rang again. A Mr. Wheeler had found himself face to face with a brightly lit egg-shaped object. Five minutes later, a car driven by Mr. Wright stalls. He gets out to take a look under the hood. Only then does he become aware that an oval shape is resting on its belly in the middle of the road bathed in a greenish blue glow. It seems to be made of aluminum. Terrified, Wright jumps back into the car. The object rises almost vertically and disappears in a fraction of a second. At a quarter after midnight, Jose Alvarez tells Officer Fowler that he has just come across an object sitting in the middle of the road and noticed the same physical effects on his car. Fowler is by now beginning to realize that something out of the ordinary is happening. He decides to send several police vehicles to the sector. At 12.45 a.m., another truck stalls in the face of a ball of fire, which changes color before taking off. And at a quarter after one o'clock, Sheriff Clem and his deputy observe at three or four hundred yards an oval light resembling a reddish sun. 
three other patrols see the object flash across the sky. A quarter of an hour later, a last truck driver, James Long, calls Officer Fowler. In all, his log records eight distinct cases of vehicles immobilized in the presence of a UFO in a space of less than two hours. And that's not all. Reports of more sightings also came in from the surrounding district. The witnesses in the Level Land case did not know one another. The sightings they made were completely independent. What more conclusive evidence could we have for the reality of the UFO phenomenon? But the riddle remains unsolved. Exactly what does this cat and mouse game with cars mean? Burning steam emitted by a UFO left these marks on Stefan Mikalak's stomach. His gloves and clothes caught on fire. Treatment of the burns lasted 18 months. Mikolak was examined by 27 specialists, none of them able to diagnose the cause of his burns. In this lavender field in France, a close encounter of the third kind. Farmer Maurice Mas was 30 yards away from a small egg-shaped object. Two small creatures about three feet tall were standing in front of a sliding door. When one of them pointed a metallic tube at the witness, he was paralyzed. The humanoids climbed back on board the craft, which promptly disappeared. The patch of ground was left hard, like concrete. Mass could not get lavender to grow there for seven years. During this close encounter of the third kind in Canada, the grass was scorched in two places. Just before midday, the witnesses saw what they took to be a tent in their fields. It was a bright yellow dome about 25 yards across. A cube shape emerged from it, and some small creatures moved very busily and rapidly back and forth between the two. The witnesses assumed they were Boy Scouts and dismissed the matter from their minds, until a neighbor told them she had seen the dome disappear into the clouds, apparently not the local scout troop after all. Strange visitors like these have been observed by hundreds of people throughout the world. They are always humanoid in shape. Here are a few samples. Any resemblance between ourselves and creatures from outer space may seem a little hard to swallow at first. We can be sure, at least, that the organic structure of such beings must be essentially the same as our own. That is, based on the carbon atom with water as solvent. The striking similarities between humans and humanoids might also indicate the uniqueness of the DNA molecule as a genetic building block. As a general rule, they are either smaller or taller than us, usually around four or ten feet. Thirty years ago, it was generally considered that flying saucers came from Mars. During the last century, Schiaparelli thought he had discovered canals on the surface of the planet. The Mariner programs have destroyed these myths. On the other hand, a slight atmosphere and traces of water have been discovered on Mars. Recent photographs have revealed the geological features of the entire surface of our neighbor. Strange, sinuous troughs have bewildered astronomers. Only a violently coursing liquid could have dug these riverbeds. During glacial periods like the present one, 
the water on Mars would have frozen as polar caps. As the planet warmed up, the ice would melt again. Clouds would form to bathe the planet for thousands of years. In 1976, the Viking probe landed on Mars and was able to photograph its landscape for the first time. A remote-controlled laboratory is analyzing the soil. The results are not conclusive, but at least they have not disproved the existence of life, as the zone prospected was very poor. In any case, life on Mars or Jupiter would be micro-organic. To find intelligent life, we must look outside our solar system. In November 1974, a code message was dispatched in the direction of a cluster of 300,000 stars from Arecibo in Puerto Rico, where an entire valley has been transformed into a gigantic radio wave reflector. This is part of an ambitious scientific program going under the name of SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. <laughs> Professor Carl Sagan is explaining the contents of another message sent to extraterrestrials this time via a space probe. As well as the etching of the Earthling couple, the plaque specifies the position of our solar system in the Milky Way. Will this message ever be read in outer space? It will take Pioneer 10 billion years to reach the constellations of Ursa Major and Orion. NASA also has plans for vast and expensive programs, like the setting up of radio telescopes on the moon, where there is no atmosphere to disturb messages from other corners of the universe. How ironic it would be, though, if it should prove that the proof of extraterrestrial intelligence has been under our noses all the time, while we continue to spend our time and energy searching for it elsewhere. Soon, we shall be out there in the galaxy. Space colonies may be in existence in less than a hundred years' time. Gerard O'Neill, a physicist from Princeton, conceived this wheel to accommodate 10,000 people. One revolution per minute creates an artificial gravity field. NASA proposes enormous power stations to gather solar energy. The materials for the colony will be quarried on the moon because of the weak lunar gravity. UFOs themselves are on missions from similar space colonies. Permanent artificial planets passing close to Earth 
and sending off scouts, explorers, tourists maybe. We would surely be as curious to them as they are to us. And in fact, cases do exist where communication has been established with occupants of UFOs. A close encounter of the third kind in New Guinea. Father Gill, a meticulous man, made notes. Here are some extracts from his vivid, minute-by-minute -minute account of what occurred. Six fifty-five p.m. Something moving on top. A man. Now three beings moving, luminous, busy on the bridge. Craft leaves. Seven p.m. Men. Seven o four. One, then two again. 7.10 p.m. Men appear, also a shaft of blue light. The men gone, the projector still there. 7.20 p.m. Projector turned off, men gone. UFO passes through a cloud. 8.28 p.m. Sky above lit up, big cloud over Dagora. I saw the UFO high up and called the station people. 9.05 p.m. Cloud formation, numbers 2, 3, 4, gone. 10 p.m. Still stationary. 10.10 10 p.m. Craft gone again. and Barney Hill, we are on the threshold of a mind-shattering possibility, direct contact with alien beings. Late at night, on their way home from a holiday in Canada, the hills see a strange light in the sky, as sketched here by Betty Hill. On the same night, in the same area, the phenomenon is spotted by radar. It chases their car and finally lands in front of them, through his binoculars, Barney can see creatures. One of them looks at him fixedly. Then everything goes hazy in their memory. Later, they come to their senses driving towards Portsmouth. Home again, they realize that their trip has lasted two hours more than foreseen. For several months, they will experience physical and mental problems and decide to consult Dr. Simon of Boston, renowned for his cures of amnesiacs. The hills are hypnotized separately. Neither knows what the other has revealed to the doctor, yet the two accounts concur perfectly. According to the hills' testimony under hypnosis, the craft landed on the highway, Creatures got out of it and led Betty and Barney on board. Here it is in cross-section. They underwent separate medical examinations. Skin, fingernail and hair samples were taken. This sketch drawn under hypnosis shows one of the occupants. The creatures were smallish and communicated by telepathy. 
their eyes were striking, very large and stretching towards the temples. Betty asked the leader where they came from. He then showed her a three-dimensional space chart, which Betty was able to reproduce when requested to do so by Dr. Simon. The leader explained that the multiple lines represented busy routes from one star to another, the single lines were used less frequently, and the dotted lines indicated exploratory routes. A young teacher from Ohio, Marjorie Fish, had the brilliant idea of considering this star map from the point of view of the visitor's base in the lower right-hand corner. Armed with a supply of wooden beads, she began to construct three-dimensional models of the universe, representing stellar systems within a radius of 50 light years. Marjorie Fish chose only those stars liable to sustain life. The scale of star classification goes from the blue and mauve stars to the red giants and supergiants. The excessive cold or heat of these extremes of the scale would prohibit any form of carbon-based life developing on their planets. A yellow star, like our Sun, has a core about a million miles in diameter, dense enough to provoke nuclear combustion with a temperature reaching 9 million degrees centigrade. Marjorie Fish ended up with 46 yellow suns. Here are those which are visible from the southern hemisphere. From 1968 to 1973, she patiently constructed several models of our stellar neighborhood. Using data from the Gliese catalog, the most up-to-date astronomical map, a computer can reproduce exactly that area of the Milky Way coinciding with Betty's sketch. Even an astronomer could not have drawn Betty's map when she did it for Dr. Simon, as this area of space had not been carefully charted then. So where did those visitors come from? From a system of twin stars, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2, in the reticular constellation, 25 light years from our sun. All the other stars on the map are capable of sustaining life on their planets. Statistically, the chances of Betty Hill's map attaining this accuracy by pure chance are one out of 10,000. The routes followed by Zeta inhabitants appear logical and practical. Betty's map offers some astonishing evidence. For the first time, Science has been able to confirm the authenticity of information received by an eyewitness from extraterrestrials. How could they have traveled from there to here? 25 light years at the speed of light means a round trip of 50 years. According to Einstein, by the time they returned to Zeta Reticuli, the alien astronauts would not recognize their own world it would have aged by several hundred years. Black holes could be the key to the enigma. Astronomers say anything might be possible inside or through a black hole. What are they? Merely a star at the moment of its death. A huge collapsing of its entire mass and energy creating a gravitational field of inconceivable magnitude. Black holes are monsters on a cosmic scale. Even their own light is swallowed up.
other neighboring stars disappear into the bottomless pit. Where does all this matter disappear to? At what speed? Black holes might very well be space tunnels, shortcuts in space that a highly advanced civilization has learned to utilize to span not only a few light years, but billions. Maybe it is easier to travel to Earth from the ends of the universe than from the nearest stars. Maybe Betty Hill's map can lead us to another galaxy. Maybe. We do not yet hold the key to the mystery in our grasp. For all we know, the UFO phenomenon is simply a tactic designed to accustom us human beings to the idea of contact with extraterrestrial beings. How long before we are judged ready?